interesting time. I love the 19th century. It had so, certain things about it that I just studied and just, just fascinated me. I just gravitated to a couple of reasons. One of them is the Underground Railroad. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And it basically said that any bureaucrat, anywhere in the federal government, if he knows about a runaway slave, it's his duty to turn him in. So if I'm a post, postman and I have moral objections against slavery and I'm working in, up north somewhere in Pennsylvania and a friend tells me about a runaway slave, it's my duty or I can be fined $1,000. That's like $26,000 of today's money. Half your salary, maybe more. What the Second Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 did is made the North responsible for enforcing Southern slavery in a backhanded way. And that kind of backfired. Some people said, you know, that's enough. Enough's enough. You know, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it was a, the Underground Railroad in action. And it put the North on notice, like, wow, there's this, there's this whole movement out there. I want to be a part of it, or I hate it, one or the other. It, you definitely had a reaction to it, good or bad. Probably just having a reaction was good. So she wrote the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The man says, where's my slave, my runaway slave, Tice Davis? And the guy says, lying through his teeth, well, I have no idea. Oh, come on, you have to see him come through here. He came right off the landing here. He said, well, I have no idea. Then his master said something, I don't know his name, said he must have gone off in an underground railroad, right? That's how the name became, right here in Ripley, Ohio. It's a sarcastic name, Quantrill Raiders and several others, and he was all involved in that. And he, had, he hatched this idea that I'm going to take an arsenal somewhere near the border, use all the armaments, arm the slaves, and we're going to forge a path through Virginia and start freeing slaves. Frederick Douglass is going, John Brown, I don't think that's going to work too well. Even Harriet Tubman, had, hey, she's you know, simple as she was, saying, I don't know about this one. I'll help you get a few volunteers and stuff. Well, he took the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Harper's Ferry, Virginia at that time, very easily. It was only on what's happening at the John Brown trial. What's going to happen? How's this going to go? In the meantime, the South's going, man, if this guy can do this, we better start arming ourselves for an impending war coming up. And they did. And John Brown's trial was, you know, they found him guilty and they hung him. He definitely was a man of action. He definitely pushed the country to a point where the tinderbox was all it needed was nothing almost to do to get the Civil War started. And it became a rallying cry for the North, John Brown's body. He had a, a million people were killed in the Civil War. One out of every 30 people perished who lived in that time during the Civil War. Bloody, bloody war. Did it have to come down to the Civil War? I think it did. In my opinion, I think it did. We had this thing called slavery, and only one man could have ever got us through it, and that's President Lincoln, and to make us a better country. One thing that touches me, I imagine some of you may have seen the Ken Burns episode on the Civil War. One thing he said is before the Civil War, the United States, we, the United States, was an R. The United States are going to do this. The United States plans to do this. After the Civil War, the United States became and is. The United States is. We were a different country. A better tumble Midwestern farm boys. It didn't take any, any guff from anything. He shaped them up. Then he started marching down the rivers, down the Tennessee River. And he had his first big victory. The first Union victory, probably one of the earliest, was at Fort Donaldson and Fort Henry near Paducah, Kentucky. And one of his old West Point buddies was the Confederate general in charge, a guy named William Simon Bolivar Buckner. And Grant had him. He had him. He had him. He had him. And he said, all right, Buckner, surrender, unconditional surrender. And Buckner says, how unchivalrous, unconditional surrender. You want it or not? You know, and Buckner had to do it. Well, <coughs> when Buckner surrendered, Grant gave him his wallet and said, take care of your men. You know, when Grant was president, Grant was good at one thing as a young man, horses and people probably. He was good with horses. Him and his wife, Julie, is down. He's the president of the country. You go down 16th Street in D.C. with his horse and buggy. You say, how fast can his horse go with his buggy, Julie? You want to find out? So they're going down 6th Street, to hop, hippie hopping around. And all of a sudden, just a black policeman didn't know, who, didn't know who's in the carriage. And oh, geez, President Grant. Geez, I, I keep going. I didn't know it was you. Well, Grant says, no, no. Give me a ticket. I, I was speeding. How many politicians today would do that? Oh. Horrible. He, he empathized with the man, as he always did. And after the, they signed the terms of surrender, you know, Grant was very generous to the Southerners. And then when the people outside heard, they finally surrendered at North shooting off their guns, and they're like, yippee, finally we won this thinking war. 
And Grant goes outside and says, knock it off. These are our countrymen now. Classy guy, real classy guy. 